Jackson had Stephanie Davidson and Gail Rafalidis of Davidson Rafalidis located in Buffalo, New York. Stephanie earned her architecture degree from Dalhousie uh, uh, University in Halifax and the Architecture Association in London. Georg earned his architecture degree from the University of Applied Science in Munich and the Architecture Association in London. Stephanie and Georg both currently teach in the University of Toronto and the State University of New York at Buffalo. The work of Davidson Rafalidis has won too many awards to list tonight, and in addition, their work has been recognized extensively through publications, exhibitions, lectures, and grants. When I first looked at the work of Davidson Rafalidis, I thought, wow, less is definitely more. And the closer that I look at their practice, the more that rings true. They're a small firm where both principals teach and run the practice. From a practical standpoint, their work needs to be on point, efficient, and economical while still passing a pump. And that's exactly what it is. When reviewing the work, the jurors agreed that the work has a quiet yet potent combination of strong and practical moves that is very sophisticated in its ability to be, ability to be in dialogue with its surroundings, be it an existing building, a strip mall, or the street. In their statement, they talk about generous architecture, one that prompts unforeseen new uses and transformations. It is interesting, it is an interesting point to think about an architectural practice that recognizes the continual story of the building of space and the evolution of the space through time and use. Given this approach, what makes their work work so well is the quality of the space, not a prescriptive idea of how it is necessarily used. In fact, their work focuses on the reuse or misuse of existing buildings and spaces. They prioritize space taking through light, reflection, material, view, dimension, etc. In sense when you look at the work, it is open and yet highly calibrated. In a time where we are always creating checklists for lead certification and quantifying what is sustainable, the design of spaces that are in it for the long game, spaces that create a real sense of place where you can imagine many different types of activity happening, perhaps that is the highest standard of sustainability. As you will see tonight, Davidson Rafalidis work achieves this and much more. Please join me in welcoming Stephanie and Gerald and Davidson Rafalidis. Thank you, of course, for the architectural leads. It's been an amazing opportunity to be here. In this presentation, we'd like to share some work and some of the thinking behind the work. Each project that we do is a study without a distinct beginning and end. Some studies just remain as observations, and others go a bit further and become drawings, while others become built interventions. But even if or when projects are realized, we continue to study them since we see spaces as dynamic, ever-changing, and animate, animate things. One type of ongoing daily study that we do is just to observe our everyday environment, like many people do, to try to learn from it. We live, we live on the edge of Buffalo here in New York State, near the university, where we both work as architecture faculty. We spend a long time, a lot of our time driving the same or similar routes. And we notice buildings or situations or atmospheres that interest us for some reason. One main insight that we get by looking around in our built environment is that over time, many buildings stray from the original intentions of a designer or the brief of the client or the, or the desires of the owner. Just like people's lives, these buildings and cities go through phases and constant change. Buildings develop lives of their own. They can be unpredictable. They become spaces and places that the original designer or owner might not have ever imagined. And so, a main approach that runs through all of our studies is a recognition that buildings very often outlive their intended use. 
So in all of our studies that we'll show, we ask ourselves, how can we create buildings that are meaningful for the long term when uses and business plans are so short-lived? And what does it mean for our design process when programs are the most short-lived and inconsequential part of buildings? So, uh, the first thing we really want to tell is that the system entry, we call it, uh, it's, um, we call it team zoning, and it was our uh, entry to the competition with Twitter here, reinventing um, the script model. It's organized by the University of Alberta uh, in Canada, and it asked designers to tackle the question of uh, the dying script model, which is something. Um, This is something that we also encounter in our day-to-day -day experience um, uh, in Buffalo. So we chose a case study, um, uh, it's called uh, Central Park Plaza in Buffalo. And what we did is, um, what we always do when we start studying um, an object, we started drawing it. So we got like an infrastructure plan in the city, um, we, we measured the building, we made an inventory of all the building elements, and um, we actually decided to make a sort of motion animation uh, for the project presented. And what you see here actually this slide at this sort of motion animation, like over a thousand slides. We also looked at um, historic examples of precedents where um, a big structure became obsolete. So um, Roman amphitheaters, for example, um, were built in every Roman town that was a collapse of the Roman Empire. Um, they started to uh, develop a surprising life of their own. So here you see and the amphitheater in Luca in Italy, and what you can see is that the amphitheater actually became a building or like a, like a material quarry for new construction, and the new construction nestled um, onto the existing foundation. And what's so interesting here is that something radically new emerged with just what was at hand, and, and it still has a key reference of the um, of the old space. One thing you can see that so it still has a clear reference to the existing or the, to the pattern because you see it over there. So the competition of course asked for the reuse of that um, strip mall, um, but, but we couldn't see any any qualities in, in, in the existing space. So so we thought, well, the only quality that has is actually just the, the longevity of the building material. And so we, we proposed like a similar um, uh, strategy as uh, the president in Luca. So, what we said is, um, so we proposed um, to take it apart and just keep the foundation intact with all the infrastructure. Foundations are the most durable and expensive building part anyway. We also proposed to list all, uh, all zoning restrictions on the site and allow users to repurpose the building components on the mall. To build whatever they needed and whatever form suited them on the existing uh, foundation. So the foundation would be the feedback for the new construction. So we created this very large drawing, um, which became like a narrative drawing. It contained so much information that you could zoom in and in and always discover something new, like like zooming in Google Earth. And um, and what you can see zoomed in also is that the, the drawing is actually constructed from, from the text that from the photograph we showed at the very beginning of the strip mall. So we wanted to make a drawing that is solely exclusively constructed by rearranging the first photograph. This is the same image as the photograph we showed from the strip mall, just cut in pieces and created these things. So the, the goal was, or the result, what we thought, could be like a new kind of economic and uh, new zone triggering this kind of open-ended typological evolution. And with the graphic reference, um, we use these kind of um, drawings, or in this process, like a reference for us, uh, from the Edo period in Japan. And they depict this kind of uh, prosperous society that uh, indulged in this informal pleasure during a time of a very, very strict military rule. And these drawings are all constructed to parallel projection, and that gives that the density of activity. So you see this extent activity in all these stories, and like quotes in one image, like a, like a story in one image. 
I never saw the study of everyday life or actually our visits to my parents in Greece. Observing the building culture there has had an impact on how we envision um, construction processes. So just as we imagined um, the Trypno project, which developed over decades, the omnipresent polycarpic theater college in Greece also developed over decades. Um, the polycarpic theater college where it means poly means many and carpic means um, apartments, so literally translated means many apartments, but that doesn't describe it well. What the essential is, is that concrete slab and post construction that, um, that has a phase um, construction and inhabitation. So at the beginning, like the final form of a polycarpic here, we really can't be really foreseen at the start of the construction and the building can spend for several years at this kind of like half finished thing. So this is a polycarpic here, the hometown of my parents, which is documented like, for a decade now maybe. Um, so this is in 2011, um, uh, you see this gradient of finishes and the, the, like the, the bottom floor is the way inhabited, and this is the same building uh, last summer. It's just maybe hard to see there's a key in front of it, but the second floor is now inhabited. So, what you find so interesting in these structures that um, this, not only serve as single users, they're, like, they're related to the notion of polyvalency as developed by the back architect Cameron Herzberger. And what's interesting about these structures is that these structures, um, they, the meaning of the form of these structures is not just inherent in the building, it's actually constantly renegotiated with each individual user and the building. So, it's, it's a constant relationship. And you can always be different, and, and the building is an active part of that, not a passive object. It, the, the building is a partner in that relationship. So that polycarpic here I just showed. So that, that's the construction site here. The construction site of polycarpic here in Pakistan, in the in the neighboring village of Makara. And you can see already, but the people here is an indication that what we find the best way is not finished, it's not completed, but it's already used. Um, and to be intrigued like how, uh, how people started using it, although it's not completed, and the building and the people, the former relationship is totally independent from any original design intention. So the building develops its own agency and people form their own idiosyncratic reading of it. So a Reba match, for example, becomes an ad hoc door, and the immediate of the hinge feature and things will be just, just beautiful. So we were serving and drawing it. So here's the roof plan with the prominent reverb sticking out. And the chance encounter between the figurative element of inhabitation and the abstract shape of the structure, they couldn't be designed in advance. They're with emerging compositions, which just turned out to be rather interesting and beautiful. So here you see how the reverb sticks out for future expansions, future expansions, uh, similar to an exquisite corpse drawing that is Availing its next uh, contribution. And we are also amazed that during the construction phase, these buildings are always much more beautiful and powerful compared to when they're completed, especially these polycarpic buildings. So we aim to keep, to keep the quality of the unfinished or some, some aspect of the unfinished in all of our work. But you can see this drawing too, that we always draw in habitation structure in exactly the same way to emphasize the relation between intention and challenge to do this is like, like essentially all of our drawings. And these structures are everyday objects. They just fill the fabric of cities and villages in Greece and we are inspired by these very mundane things that happen in and around the city. So for us, these are legitimate informants of our way of working and thinking. Another study that we revisited a few times over the past three years is something that we've called continual construction. And in the city, in the study, we apply strategies directly from the polytheistia construction process and the idea of an inhabited construction site. So we're both foreigners to the U.S. and for a long time, for several years, we had no credit history until recently it was impossible for us to get a mortgage. So we thought about alternative financial and construction models for building something, even for ourselves, which has really been our dream. And the idea is that the process could be used by others who are locked into renting housing, maybe because of bad credit or no credit history. 
And the approach works recent because vacant city lots in Buffalo are still inexpensive. We bought this one for $4,500. And each time we revised the study, we used stop motion animation and a narrative structure to imagine and to show how the story might play out over several decades. The study really questions the preconception that a house has to be one very large purchase that happens all at once. And instead, the study looks at how the process of construction could be tied to a process of inhabitation and a careful and deliberate sourcing of materials and shaping the spaces of a dwelling in a gradual way. The proposal is a process uh, where the construction itself requires the same financial load as a typical 10-year mortgage. And this set of drawings uh, are just some select drawings in a series that shows some of the key stages in construction and inhabitation. So at the beginning, um, just having enough stage uh, to pay for a first load of gravel to start construction and being really excited, like from our part of the study and putting furniture already out on the newly purchased site. And then this is actually a, a major heater for some heat source uh, to huddle around with the furniture. And then with the special clay tile, eventually in, a, in an additive process over 10 years, um, building a kind of humble 1100 square foot dwelling. So, what we're most interested here are two things. First, is the building is performing a financial service. And the second is that it's not only a continual construction, but it's also a continual design which is tied in real time to the lived in experiences, needs, and desires of the user. So, um, this is another study that shows uh, that this piece of our intervention is one um, or episode of many other past ones as well as future ones to come. So, it's the corner store of, uh, in the west side of Buffalo in New York. And it's very for you. And it looked like this in 2012. And we can, of course, to convert it into a cafe. But we rather used it as a study in how to develop a space that um, is not specific to single use. Rather, we thought about what in this space could be used long term as different tenants might come and go. As the main reference for this study, uh, Sir Robert Clyson's Hard Recall from 1590 in England. So the rank Hard Recall, Moglar, the wall, became associated with the building because of its generous opening. And Peter Smithson described this plan, you can see here, uh, in his book, Conversation with Students, as a thick spine wall where all the fireplaces are in the center and the perimeter bay windows where the natural light comes in. And he described how in wintertime the family would pull back to the fireplaces in the summer, they would enjoy the perimeter with the big windows on the other floor. So how to call it essentially an inhabited air conditioning room. Um, with the whole temperature gradient spanning from the window uh, to the and in the very same way, instead of having a steel interior, we wanted to offer the pleasures of winter and summer to the visitors. So in the public hall, the cafe space has oversized, operable, folding sliding windows, which connect the indoors to the outdoors in warm months. And a masonry heater in the back of the space. So a masonry heater um, is it's a heater where the fire actually burns on for a very short time, like one hour per day. And the exhaust heat of the fire is absorbed by the masonry and radiates into the space for 24 hours. So it's a, it's a very efficient form of heating this uh, wood. Um, it's similar to the hypercore system, the Roman hypercore system. And um, so you see like a, the, the seating bench, it's a 15 foot long seating bench, and the flue actually runs through the heating bench, and so warming up the heating bench. So the heating bench hits the radiator. Um, and it was developed and researched together with a local mason, Jonathan Steele, who was a test of the, the thermal behavior of the cement tile and the cladding. And it's part of an ongoing research in looking at how space can be organized using very elemental um, ingredients, just like temperature and light. So, this illustration shows the space in cold weather when uh, people huddle um, around the uh, Itself, and this is the warm weather around the perimeter, um, sitting on these uh, windowsills. 
And the standout here, they also have uh, a function in environmental control. So it's, when it's very hot, a few days in Buffalo, where it gets very hot, um, there's a draft, pulls out the air, and the air is pulled in from the big windows, and there's a constant pump of the draft. So these are studies of what else might happen in this space. So this is um, a co working space, so one time it might be something different. We can have a place with a stand presence. Lowest or a user place, and all these users they find their own idiosyncratic readings of the qualities of their space. The interventions um, in the space are restricted mainly to the windows and the heater. Of course, it has economic reasons that was mentioned, but um, another reason why many of the surfaces remain untouched is that we wanted our intervention to be just that they exist alongside the past building and also alongside. Interventions that there are to come to the space is meant to be open ended, not, not closed, not to be finished. Um, and the, the, object, the objective was that interventions help the space to live longer and function longer without the need for expensive remodeling or demolition. And because it's been in use for a few years now, we have a chance to actually study it also in Buffalo's climate and long winters. And it's been enjoyable to watch the very instinctive responses to the space, which are totally independent from any official program. In this, in this most recent study, um, just realized this past summer, similar to, to the cafe, the spatial qualities transform radically together with the seasons, and changes made to the space I thought of as not specific to just one use. The building was originally used as a taxi cab repair shop, and like the cafe, it dates back to the 1920s. Because the building is located in a historic district, the conditional variance was given to convert it to a garage for a living space, provided that no changes were made to it during the cell, the facade. So one strategy that we used was to keep the roof as a fixed facade and insert 10 operable skylights and a roof hot for natural light, ventilation, and roof access. Here you see a model study with and without skylight, so with the main user of the space changing from cars to people, increased natural light and ventilation were important we thought. This is just showing a moment when the decking was cut and the light seems to be impatiently waiting to rush in, which it then did and, and really did So, like other projects, we approached the same study. And at the beginning, we looked very closely at the existing plan, the existing geometry of the material palette. Normally, we try, like Stella mentioned, to change as little as possible and add as little as possible. Um, so we reinterpreted a small enclosure within the space, which you can see here, that had been built recently as a contract with us a few to 10 years ago. In our study of the space, our interpretation so the little enclosure which you see here is as an overlap between the bigger spaces A and the exterior garden A and the big workshop. So to change the space into a small apartment for a couple, we mainly took surfaces away, like the floor finish and the drop ceiling. And this photo is taken from the same spot and shows how the new elements were handled more like objects or furniture and placed in the space. So in large openings also extend the small apartment to, to the workshop space, the rougher, bigger workshop space, and of course the, the private garden where a 23-foot-wide retractable awning was installed with a 13-foot cantilever, which really transforms the garden into another exterior room in the one month. The spaces of the project aren't assigned traditional uses or fixed uses. Instead, the spaces are seasonally responsive and continually in flux. Inhabitation can retreat into the warm and insulated little space in the harsh winters, so you can hear a couple of cuddling and all of the residential furniture sort of compacted in that 400 square foot space. And then in warmer weather, this could, the small space could be used just for dining and you could see the, the bedroom and the living room spreads into these larger uninsulated spaces. 
in the exterior room, the garden, and things as well. So, in this sense, the living area can be anywhere between about 450 square feet to 5,000 square feet. The finishes and the materials in the study range very much in the different spaces. The little space had a bigger budget, and the big space had a small budget. Two thirds of the, the budget was invested in the little space, which has more refined materials and finishes, and both fixed and movable furniture elements to meet the needs of the inhabitants. So, to, to facilitate what was happening in that plan illustration, um, wardrobes like this are uh, unplastered and can be easily moved uh, around and moved into the workshop. In contrast, the, the construction cost to refurbish the big space amounted to $10, around $10 a square foot. And like the cafe project, the decision not to finish, trim, or seal elements was very intentional because we see this residential intervention as just one of many that have happened and will continue to happen very likely in this building. And like with the cafe space, we're just curious to investigate other possible uses in the same space. Through drawing. This shows the workshop, the, what was actually constructed for the workshop space and the small living space. This converts the, the whole building back to a general contractor's office, office space, and workshop with a pickup truck that are everywhere in Buffalo. This scenario illustrates the space of the pet, the local pet rescue. It's a van and um, space for animals in an office space. And then finally, uh, a small gym or fitness center where the outdoor space can be used for, for weight training or fitness. And, uh, and the interior is kind of a place for smoothies and uh, protein shakes. So, what was really satisfying, we become really obsessive about these drawings, but it, it's one of our ways of continuing to study, even and we did these after the project was realized, just to really um, test ourselves and imagine and investigate further uh, how they could be used. And we think what's exciting is that um, many uses could benefit from such different spaces. Uh, if you look at that, uh, and that I believe it's um, coincidentally um, also addresses two distinct cases. You see this. Um, it's also another study that tries to uh, make spaces that are not specific to, to a single use. But sorry, and it also uses similar strategies as I said before. Um, so the first strategy is to combine with that. I mean, like I said, that it's a studio for an artist couple and their love for plans. The first strategy was to collapse three radically different um, spaces and atmospheres together. And this is the first space. This is the space for the painting, mm -hmm. and this is the photograph of heat. So it's a space with top light, very even light, and there's no view outside. Um, and this is the second space. This is the, the space for the ceramicist, mm -hmm. and um, this is the photograph of it. And that space has framed views. Um, it has not very even light, it has um, like uh, all the range of light from very dark to very bright, and it's not very strong of wood because um, the, the surface is not sealed, they're just soaked. And there are a lot of work for the same table. And this is the third space, it, that's the space for the clients. And this is a, a photo of it, and, and that's a space that um, is direct from there. So that's like nearly outside, like the, the light comes in from all sides and the colors come in, but there's no there's no direct view, so the view is just kind of blurry things, so it's nearly outside. Um, and you see this three spaces like three characters, like three characters, like animate things that, um, that we need to, to relate to. And here in this image, you see how these three spaces um, are combined together. Um, and um, they combine together in a very hard way, there's a hard collision of these three very different atmospheres. And that, that exaggerates and amplifies this different um, 
uh, atmospheres and also it becomes like this kind of space that asks like what else could I actually be? Because it's so overpowering these different qualities mushed together. And what we can also see the second strategy is that there's a hard cut here. And um, and that hard cut is like a horizontal split of the space with two layers. There's a top layer with uh, it's very um, articulated so to create space without uh, any need for walls and the bottom layer is totally open, it's open articulation with a lot. And the and the um, the precedent for that was uh, the the, the most in Cordoba. So there's also a space where there's a hard cut in the middle and there's two layers and the bottom layer is totally open, open circulation and all the specificity is um, at the top of the roof. And that's another building that holds all sorts of different things uh, throughout this long uh, lifespan. And what you can see here is that um, uh, another one of our inhabitation studies that shows the first where that there's no stationary time. And the climate conditioning also underscores this dynamic space because we have to use um, these uh, sliding, folding doors to adapt the space uh, to different weather conditions. So using it adapts spatially to the seasons instead of mechanically. So we also uh, recently wrote a book together which is called Processes of Creating Process, Processes of Creating Space. It's meant to be a textbook or a handbook to walk students through a process of designing where they use spaces that they encounter in their everyday environment as a starting point. The book presents the idea that every day is a study, and that learning about space and architecture shouldn't just be restricted to the material that instructors lecture about in courses. The book is structured in two parts, assignments and techniques, and the techniques include media that might not normally be found in architecture classes like plaster mold making, flip casting, paper casting, um, and other very material intensive approaches. Students are asked to look with fresh eyes at the spaces that they experience every day. And we, for example, use our office um, in the book. Uh, we wanted to show that spaces are building in our opinion don't have to be glamorous or celebrated in order to have something valuable to teach us. Um, I'm actually using the textbook right now for the first time to teach a course, and these are some of the spaces that the students submitted to me. They chose just a few weeks ago, they chose these spaces to study, and I was really curious and excited to see what they would choose. So many chose spaces in or around where they live, but you can also see here a courtyard of a funeral home down in the bottom. Someone chose an, uh, an entry lobby into a restaurant, so they were definitely, I think, looking with fresh eyes and, and looking at finding new potentials and spaces they encountered every day. So, using these everyday spaces as starting points, the semester long study incorporates different media to analyze and understand the space. And one task is to make a multi part plaster mold around the mass model of the space. The idea is that one space can generate a whole new set of forms, which have to be reinterpreted by the students, similar to the way in which we reinterpreted the given spaces in big space, little space, or really any kind of adaptive reuse when characters and spaces already exist. Students investigate these forms further in different interrelationships and configurations, and one main effort here in, and in the entire book was to create a balance in a design process between control and chance and really kind of invite unpredictability into into a design process and way of thinking. Ultimately, students choose one configuration and make what we call a new unity, a paper cast, the exterior shell of the, the space using toilet paper, so that the interior can be documented and studied in sort of consequences. And so, yeah, we're excited about the process we present in the book, and we'd really like to try it for ourselves to see a full scale book result. Okay. So, and this is the last study we'll show tonight. Um, this is what, what something we've been re recently, more recently, uh, thinking about. The idea of embracing or even designing disintegration and decay came out of our own habitual study of our everyday environment. So every day we wake up in our house, and out of habit we look around, we study the house, more passively than actively really, and our house right now is, a, is about 100 years old, so it has some signs of age, and in the winter especially, 
that I can find with this thing, like the basement has some leaky spots and the windows without storms or the moisture causes problems. There's some slowly rotting wood at one corner, exterior that sits in the snow and moisture year after year. On the inside, there are some things that are broken here and there. They give us kind of peeks into the layers of construction. There are a lot of cracks in our house. They get bigger in winter. So there's condensation between the window panes. Stairs that are tipping over because of a rotten post in the basement. Things generally shifted and just not square anymore. But these types of observations, they, they don't bother us uh, as much as kind of engage us and make us think differently about this change and this disintegration. The, the observations together with all the studies where we look at how buildings outlive uses and normally outlive us made us wonder about the opposite. So we wondered what could happen if we embrace disintegration and decay and design short-term spaces that were meant to decompose after their intended use instead of dealing with issues like vacant strip malls littering the landscape. So over the past couple of years, we've taught studios where we've asked students to cast thin cell structures with cellulose material, uh, building on the toilet paper costumes from the book. The intention is that the cells have the ability to totally decompose, and some students harvested their own material, like cut grass clippings. They made it into pulp and then large paper thin sheets. And it creates kind of surprising uh, enclosures and interior environment. These students from the University of Toronto harvested cattail from the nearby Humber marshes. They cooked it and made it pulp, made it into pulp that they sprayed into large sheets. And they used several fans in the studio to blow the sheets into curved planes uh, using wind as formwork. So in all of these studies, the form finding, fabrication, and structure are all addressed simultaneously. Other student groups, um, they use more conventional paper products, recycled paper, cardboard, they made it into pulp. And this group, for example, used it both as formwork and the cast cell. The formwork was little by little taken from the interior, made into pulp, and sprayed on the exterior. And the idea here is to really enjoy the weakness and vulnerability of the material, which is so rarely done, we think, when conceiving of structures or spaces since they're, they're meant to live long lives and then. These studies we see as experiments in making spatial moments that are fleeting and also very light in their environmental impact. So, just to quickly tie up, as I mentioned at the beginning, each project that we do is a study without a distinct beginning or end, and some studies remain just as observations, sometimes may be documented poorly on our phones, and others go further and become drawings. Um, Sometimes themes for design studios with students or essays, while others become built interventions. Uh, but all of the studies are carried out with the same amount of critical rigor. And this impulse to look and to study comes out of a curiosity about how to relate to and then maybe contribute to the built environment in a meaningful way. Thanks so much.